Welcome to Future Thinkers Podcast. This is episode number 62. We invited Jordan Greenhall, the co-founder of Neurohacker, back on the show to help us understand something he's been working on called Deep Code. It's a framework that explains how we learn things and connect on a very deep level. This framework is important to understand for creating a new civilization design, as Jordan believes our current civilization is facing global collapse. This conversation comes in two parts. So in part one, we give an overview of Deep Code, what it is, how it works, and why it matters. Then we go on to talk about the cycle of learning that can be applied to anything we do. And finally, we talk about how these capacities can help us gain more sovereignty in today's world. To get the show notes for this episode, go to futurethinkers.org slash 62. The second part of the interview can be found at the same link once it goes live in about a week. This episode is brought to you by Qualia, a premium nootropic supplement that helps support mental performance and brain health. It's specifically designed to promote focus, support energy, mental clarity, mood, memory, and creativity. UV and I have both used it in the past. We really like it. And we actually met the founders and interviewed them on Future Thinkers. And you can check out those interviews. They're one of our favorites at futurethinkers.org slash Daniel and futurethinkers.org slash Jordan. They've got a new formula up called Qualia Mind. It's got more natural ingredients and you can get it at futurethinkers.org slash brain hack and you can get 10% off if you use the code future. All right, let's get into the show. Welcome to futurethinkers.org, a podcast about the evolution of technology, society, and consciousness. I'm Mike Gilliland. And I'm Yuvi Ivanova. If you're new to the show and you'd like a list of our top episodes and resources, go to futurethinkers.org slash start. And if you like our podcast, leave us a rating and a review on iTunes and elsewhere. It really helps others find the show and we really appreciate it. Is it possible we can do deep code for truck drivers? We could try. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Explain like I'm five. (laughs) <laughs> well, it's funny because there's a certain, well, let's put it this way. Um, one of the groups who might be most viscerally familiar with some of the propositions of deep code are, in fact, truck drivers. Because as we know, the uh, self driving car disruption is going to be hitting trucks relatively soon. And so yeah. truck drivers are going to find themselves on the other side of a major disruption wave. So part of the deep code proposition might be well, A, this is happening maybe B, why it's happening, and C, what it means for you, how you might be able to respond to it. I'll try to see if I can do it uh, very simply. I'll begin with something which actually may be too simple. What I'd like to first propose is that we can think about a particular thing that we humans do called civilization as a kind of a game. In a very strong sense, humans are very simple. At a basic level, we don't have that many distinct kinds of needs, maybe on the order of like 20 or 30 distinct needs, right? We need to be able to eat. We need to be able to have water. We need to have safe shelter. We need to be able to find mates. We have more than, say, dogs, because we need also to have access to creative expression and a sense of connection to something that is greater than ourselves, or so the social psychologists who studied these things tell us. But nonetheless, they're actually, there's not that long a list. And we can notice that what we try to do is we try to go about and build different kinds of institutions, say like fast food restaurants and grocery stores or collective gatherings where people cook for each other potlucks that are ways that we go about getting our needs met. And there, of course, are many, many. So we could describe a given culture as a a collection of a whole lot of different kinds of institutions and practices that collectively try to get our needs met. I'm going to say that we can, we can think about that as something like a game, meaning that there are roles that people play. There are ways of sensing or measuring whether or not it's actually being done well. You know, If you throw a dinner party, it's not necessarily the same as, say, poker or basketball, but nonetheless, there's a sense of, did it come together well or not? And certainly, if nobody ate food, you could say that it was a, a failure. And by contrast, if everybody decided to come back again, you could say maybe it was a success. But most importantly, it's kind of invented. You know, we have a very large amount of inheritances from evolution that we humans didn't play any meaningful role in doing ourselves. Right? We have our biology is received, and a large portion of our developmental path is received. But the specific cultural artifacts within um, our choices that we've made either right now, like we're choosing to communicate right now, or uh, somebody in the past made certain choices, like 
somebody at the Zoom Corporation made the choice to create this particular kind of software. So now this exists as a thing that we can access. So within the context of culture uh, as being a kind of a game, meaning that it's the thing that is constructed by humans and is held together by humans continuing to choose to interact in that game, what Deep Code has done is take a look at the current set of cultures, what I'm going to call the total civilization framework, the total set of cultures that currently exist in the world, and all the different kinds of institutions and practices that they have access to. In the context of the world as it currently exists and as it is likely to become as it goes forward. And what we've noticed is that our current civilization framework not only isn't adequate to the set of challenges that humanity is facing, but that in fact, its own design, that the way that it works on its own terms is always going to collapse under its own weight. It's a, a phrase that Daniel uses, is that it is inexorably self-terminating, uh, which is not an ELI-5, but it's something along the lines of, if you light a candle, the way that a candle works is that it consumes its fuel. So you can know for sure that at some point, the candle is going to go out. Our current civilization model has a lot of characteristics like that, meaning that we can actually take a, if you take a very, very close look at the underlying like the deep structural elements of how it actually operates, you can say, ah, sh- I see. It will always play out in a certain way. And as a consequence, it will actually collapse in some time. It's not clear how long, but in some time it will collapse. As a bit of an aside, it also has there's an unfortunate characteristic, which is that the longer you wait for it to collapse, the more significant the collapse will ultimately be. There's a point where you can identify that it's sort of overripe and it's time to begin moving on and changing things. But oftentimes, we don't actually choose to elegantly innovate new approaches. We actually choose to stick very strongly to old approaches that are failing. And what ends up happening as a result is that we get a short-term burst of what may feel like success. But what's actually happening is that we're eating our seed corn, to use that that idiom. And then what ends up happening is that when we hit rock bottom, we hit rock bottom hard. And that's why it ends up being a, a collapse. Things fall apart. So there's a lot that goes into that. There's a whole bunch in that level of analysis. And Deep Code spent a substantial amount of time looking at those kinds of things and trying to get deeper and deeper clarity to understand, well, why? Why would this be the case? And also, where are we on that trajectory? And then, of course, you can use those two ideas to make predictions about what might happen over the next 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 years. So then the second major piece has been trying to use this set of frameworks to design a new civilization. Well, it has to be able to do three things. It has to be able to deal with the kinds of problems that we will be facing in the 21st century. It has to be able to do so in the context of being in relationship with the old civilization, and it has to be able to navigate that transition. So that ends up being what you might call the design criteria of a viable future civilization. And then the third piece, what Deep Code has been doing, is then endeavoring to activate or actuate on those design characteristics. Okay, well, given this map of what's happening and of what's likely to happen, and given this sense of what things are necessary and possibly sufficient for a viable solution, what must we do? And by the way, what is urgent that we do now? Uh, And then what are the actual projects that we can engage in now that will move things with the most leverage forward? So I felt like that was pretty large syllables, but maybe that's ELI 22. Where does the term deep code come from? Actually, the a gentleman named Jim Rutt, I was collaborating with seven years ago, simply coined it. He just named it. As it turns out, it actually ends up being a very apt name because what we're looking at is the 
you know the old, um, if you give a man a fish, he eats for a day. If you teach a man a fish, he eats forever. Well, the relationship between giving and teaching is a relation of depth. That if I give you the teaching, I'm giving you something that is deeper than giving you the consequence of the practice. If I, if I teach you how to fish, I'm doing something that is deeper than merely giving you a fish. Well, you can go deeper still. What I could do is I could potentially teach you how to invent fishing. And I can go deeper still. So the recognition is that when you're dealing with the kind of problem that we're dealing with, you have to get very good at being able to go deep because you're always going to be operating on the basis of something. Something is going to be the basis of how you're making sense of what's going on and how you're making choices in that context. So if you're not able to be conscious of that basis, you're not able to be aware of that depth, and then you're not able to enter into that depth enough skillfulness to be able to actually modify and operate at that depth, what you'll end up doing is you'll end up operating, well, frankly, unconsciously. You'll be operating with blind spots. You'll be making assumptions that you don't even necessarily know that you're making. And in this case, we're actually talking about civilization itself. Um, And what I mean by that is effectively everything that human beings have been doing as well, as humans, as opposed to as primates, since pre-agriculture for 15,000 years, possibly even farther back, has to actually be examined deeply. And a lot of the details about particular things that were laid down, choices that were made possibly 75,000 years ago, have to actually be made, brought to light, examined closely as to what those choices actually imply, and then you know, maybe unwound maybe things designed to be laid down at that level of depth or possibly kind of brushed off and clarified and put back into a fabric that then becomes the basis of the kind of culture and civilization that we need. Can you give us an example? Let's take physics. So what we typically do when we're trying to do something useful is we go deep enough to have created a foundation upon which we can do the thing that we're trying to do. And then we kind of try to leave that foundation untouched unless it's not working. And so this is the entire essence of what Thomas Kuhn was exploring when he was looking at the structure of scientific revolutions. This is the guy who coined the concepts of scientific paradigms, is that a scientific paradigm is a a whole bunch of different kinds of fundamental assumptions, many of which ultimately become unconscious, meaning that we don't even know that we've made them, and are the basis upon which we then go about doing science. So if you assume, for example, that space and time are real and objective, independent of the things that are in them, this is the Newtonian model. The Newtonian model has an assumption that you can talk about something called space and you can talk about something called time Even if there is nothing else in the universe, there is still space and time. And then what happens is is that when you put something in the universe, you know, the classic thing is you imagine a sphere, like a a billiard ball. You imagine the sphere sort of appearing, and it appears in a space that is somehow already pre-existing. And it appears at a time that is already pre-existing, and then this billiard ball operates in that environment. So Newtonian physics had that as an assumption. And when we take a look at what general relativity did, it didn't operate in the context of those set of assumptions. What it did is it examined those assumptions themselves. And so when Einstein thought, hmm, what the hell actually is time? What actually is space? He brought into consciousness, he brought into conscious contemplation the nature of the assumptions of the foundations of the physics he was operating in. He then redesigned, he reconsidered those assumptions into a new concept, which is now the space-time manifold. And where you can't actually say space and time without also already including mass. Now, again, this is way outside the context of five-year-olds, but the idea is that we're always operating on the basis of a whole set of unconscious assumptions that give us the tools that we need to have to then think and do at the higher level. Well, what Deep Code has done is Deep Code has said, okay, let's notice that quite often a lot of things that are challenging now are challenging because of the assumptions, of the frameworks and the unconscious expectations that we're operating under. 
let's go deeper. And let's just keep going deeper until we get to something that is, in fact, deep enough for constructing an actual comprehensive civilization. It's like there are layers on, let's say, a sphere. And as the sphere rolls down, it collects more layers. You know, as the civilization progresses, as evolution progresses, it collects more stuff. And then whatever is on the surface is what we're aware of, is the layer that we function in. But then there are all these other foundational layers before it that we don't understand, that we take for granted, or that we assume that, you know, the top layer is all there is. And what you're saying is that we have to dig down deeper to understand what all this stuff rests on, because the stuff that is on the outside right now is no longer sustainable for itself. It's going to collapse onto itself. You've got me thinking about a few things here that are really interesting. I've never thought of the concept of what is space and time without matter in it. Like, what is an empty grid? I've never thought of that. And the other thing that really was interesting is the analogy that you started with, teach a man to fish, or give a man to fish, teach a man to fish, teach a man to invent fishing, and you said it goes deeper than that. Using that same analogy, it'd be really interesting to figure out what the next layer is that you're talking about that fits into that analogy. Well, as it turns out, there's an answer to that. This is not, well, I thought odd, because when you get down to the, these lowest levels, it actually gets very simple by definition, because most of complicatedness is all the stuff. When you get very low, it gets very simple. So almost at the bottom, not quite at the bottom. When you get to the very bottom, it actually isn't, it's not extremely simple, but it's very difficult to communicate. But almost at the bottom, we actually can identify a handful of basic capacities. I'm going to see if I can walk you through these basic capacities. One is what I'm going to call discernment. And do either of you recall the effort uh, as a kid of trying to learn how to raise one eyebrow without raising the other eyebrow? Or I can't even do that now. Anything? <laughs> oh, good. Well, now's a good time. Can, can you? <laughs> Yuppie? Or wiggle your toes independently. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, good. And, or <laughs> You're not doing it. <laughs> Oh, yeah, you're doing it. So this is a very simple thing. You can also do it, by the way, with, say, juggling, when you're trying to learn how to juggle. You're entering into a space where you don't have any idea what it would mean to be doing the right thing. When you're first trying to learn how to raise one eyebrow and not another eyebrow, you'll find that like you'll do all kinds of weird stuff. Your face will be screwed up, and you'll be making all kinds of weird faces. You'll raise both eyebrows. You'll like squeeze your nose because you don't actually have a path that knows how to do that. You have a sense of what it is you want to do. You want to raise one eyebrow, which is nice, but you don't actually know how at all. You're entering into a complete space of uncertainty. And discernment is a particular capacity of being able to sense that which is more in the direction and from that which is less in the direction. Right. And I can't actually go any deeper than that. It's the ability to sense very subtly at first very, very subtly, that which is more in the direction and that which is less. So if you use juggling as the example, if you've ever tried to learn how to juggle, there's a, a notion where you're just beginning the process, you're like throwing the ball, and then maybe you begin to get, ah, uh, oh, there it is, and like a little tiny bit. It's very vague. It can't be named or described. It's more in the sense of building a feeling and constructing a whole set of deep feelings that have a way of orienting. So the second capacity is something like attunement. But to do attunement, I have to do the third, which is coherence. So coherence is the degree to which you begin to be able to bring together a set of different kinds of senses and actions that belong together. So back to the notion of raising one eyebrow and not another eyebrow, there's a whole bunch of different kinds of things that all have to happen simultaneously. And in coherence, you're beginning to be able to grasp them as a whole. You're beginning to be able to sort of relate to them as a single coherent phenomenon and to bring them into relationship with each other where they're beginning to actually operate as a smooth whole. You can imagine that if you were to imagine, say, for example, a, a fishbowl that has a whole bunch of, of floating around in it, and you're trying to get light to shine through it to the degree to which you can go in and just very precisely move all of the dirt 
out of the water at once. That action of being able to separate dirt from water is a sense of discernment, that which is more than that which is not. And the degree to which you're actually being able to pull all of it out and you're bringing the fishbowl into coherence. You're pre having present precisely all that is necessary and precisely none that is not necessary. And you're bringing it all into a kind of relationship that causes it to come together as a whole. So now think about like the fluidity of juggling where there's a whole bunch of distinct motions. You have to be able to grab a ball. You have to be able to throw a ball. You have to be able to see it and have, have the hand-eye coordination to be able to move and catch it. But you can't do these discrete steps. You have to actually move into a stage where they're all happening as a single unit that is all in very tight relationship to each other. Attunement now then is the relationship between discernment and coherence where you're able to increasingly become capable of using discernment in the context of a given coherence to be able to achieve coherence. Um, an, an interesting metaphor that a lot of people are familiar with if they're old enough is when you're tuning a radio. If you have an old, like a FM or, or AM radio, you notice where, let's say the signal is being broadcast at 90 FM and your radio is right now at 88.5, you just get noise. It's just static. And then 88.7, 88.9, somewhere around 88.9, suddenly you can start hearing music, but it's still a lot of noise. And then when you get to 90, well, in this case, it'd be 90.1 because I'm going up by twos, it just snaps into clarity. And you can hear the music and almost all the noise drops away. You're attuning. You're actually making the, the antenna more discerning in the context of the electromagnetic frequency where it's now coherent. The antenna is coherent. The antenna is tuned to the frequency of 90.1. The signal is being broadcast at the frequency of 90.1. The whole now is the relationship between these two things. And suddenly, shoop, the music jumps out. Um, so think about the way that a child learns how to stand. Right? So it, it has just begun the process of being able to move its legs. It can crawl, but it can't quite stand. Well, standing requires things like being able to control your leg muscles, but it also requires things like being able to have really sensitive awareness of which direction your body is falling. It's not easy to be standing up on two feet. There's a lot of complexity. I think about how hard it's been to build a robot that can stand on two feet. It's a lot of sensing that needs to be done. And then micro adjustments of those muscles. So you have to have a certain capacity in having the muscles respond, not too much, not too strong, like uh, lurching back and forth, but also a sensitive feedback loop between your sensors of where you're falling and your actuators of controlling your balance so that suddenly you're now standing up. Right? So that's an example of moving into a coherent motion of being able to actually stand up is the process of having these sensitive relationships between sensing and acting that become entrained with each other until they have the space of coherence that now has an enormous amount of clarity. So that's the next step, which is clarity. Remember we talked about how the radio signal goes from static to suddenly you can hear the music very easily? When a system enters into coherence, it also enters into the state of clarity, which means that whatever signal is trying to come through can come through with a very large amount of signal with a very small amount of noise even if it has not much energy. That's a sort of a formal definition. Back to our radio station, you know, the radio antenna was broadcasting at the same level of, of energy. The amount of electricity driving the radio signal has been the same all along. You can't hear it, you can't hear it, you can't hear it. You enter into clarity and bam, you can hear it perfectly. The same thing happens in literally any kind of learning environment. Once you achieve coherence, then what happens is as you move into clarity, the thing that is endeavoring to be learned the skill of raising your eyebrow, the skill of, of juggling, the skill of fishing, suddenly becomes capable of being received without a whole lot of effort. The signal of what is going on in the world is suddenly you've become an instrument that can receive that signal. It's all of its nuance and complexity and be able to bring it in and perceive it. So then the last is embodiment, which is now that you can actually receive that signal, you now begin the process of turning it into something that you can easily access over and over again with little less and less effort. So you begin to sort of hardwire or construct a set of habits around the set of skills that you've now carefully turned into a coherent whole so that you're able to achieve a level of coherence quickly. So now you, you can juggle. And to juggle is no longer a struggle. To juggle is now a capacity that you have developed. You've now learned to fish. So now 
fishing is something that you can do. And by the way, you can do it with less and less and less energy. And then in relationship to other kinds of things, it becomes the basis for doing a whole new set of things. Now it becomes a skill or a capacity that you can plug into another cycle up. So if you imagine the development of a child, a child first has to be able to differentiate in its visual field. It has to build a certain level of discernment to separate uh, the blooming, buzzing confusion of all the shit that happens to be in the world. That As a newborn infant, literally there's no way of knowing. Then it has to be able to separate, say, a pea, a small round sphere, from a, uh, the background of a plate. Well, separately, at the same time, it's learning how to be able to notice that it has hands, and then it's being able to notice how to actually do things with its fingers to get its fingers to close with enough control that it can actually grasp something with those little fingers. So now it's got two separate capacities that it's built its habits. It's got the ability to see something, judge its distance from where it is. It's got the ability to grasp something. So now it's going to struggle and work on the, the deeper skill set of being able to see something and reach out and grab it. I don't know if you've ever raised a child, but that's a very interesting thing to watch. So then, of course, once it has the ability to see something and reach out and grab it, then it's going to work on doing something with it, bring it to its mouth. So you see the cycle, and each cycle participates in exactly the same dynamics. Discernment, attunement, coherence, clarity, insight. Insight is that process of being able to actually have that signal come all the way through and then layering it into embodiment, and then that becomes available for the next layer up. So that cycle is the deepest basis of any kind of capacity building in any possible domain. So whether you are trying to learn how to create fire or you're trying to learn how to do physics or you're trying to learn how to be in relationship with another person or you're trying to learn how to parent or you're trying to learn how to pee, it doesn't matter. Those are the fundamental basis of any ability to go from where you are to a higher level of capacity. That was the one that takes you from giving a man, giving a fish to teaching a fish to teaching how to learn how to fish to the deep basis of all possible kinds of learning in any possible domain. Right. Can you repeat the cycle again? Yeah, sure. It's discernment, attunement, coherence, clarity, insight, embodiment. I'd imagine this has been written about extensively and the, there are books people could pick up to learn. So what is the subject that this is encapsulated inside of? How to learn? Philosophy of education and developmental psychology. So coming back to round this off and bring it back to what's practical for the truck driver again, what problems does this solve for the truck driver? How does this apply for someone in their day-to-day lives? Okay, so there's going to be a couple of distinct things. The first is that because this is so deep, it turns out to be relevant regardless of what's going on. So to the degree to which you've actually developed a significant degree of embodied capacity in these raw capacities. Remember, this is the deep basis of learning itself. You now actually have the ability to learn in any context. So, for example, in a world where things are moving and changing rapidly, where maybe the path of learning how to be a plumber suddenly just evaporates because we've made those into robots. And the path of learning how to be a physicist evaporates because AI is doing that well. You know, as things are changing rapidly, you actually need to be able to have a deeper basis for relationship with the environment that you're operating in because that basis is less subject to the, the sort of the vicissitudes of superficial change. These particular characteristics, because they are in fact the deepest basis of learning, are invariant, meaning that if you build masterful skillfulness in this cycle, meaning you build mastery of discernment, mastery of attunement, mastery of coherence, mastery of clarity, mastery of insight, and mastery of embodiment, then you are fully prepared to respond to any possible set of circumstances in your environment. Meaning that if you find yourself suddenly on Mars and everybody's gone and you have no idea what to do and you're by yourself, you have the raw toolkit from which to build the tools to respond to what is happening. So it's the strongest basis, the strongest you can be, the most adaptive you can possibly be. Now, as a truck driver, you're going to find yourself very soon in a circumstance where the set of skills that you've built are increasingly obsolete. And this is true, by the way, of course, of almost everybody, that for a very long period of time, several centuries at least, We've operated on an educational structure where 
we give people knowledge and we give them very specific skills, but we do not give them the basis of learning so that they can be robots ultimately. You can add two plus two in your head, but you don't have any idea what it means to have actually invented arithmetic. You can't actually understand why two plus two equals four. You could just do it, wrote, right? And that was a, the phase of human civilization where creating a very large number of robots was useful and important. And I don't mean that disparagingly. I mean it in the very specific sense that people were, have been trained to have certain kinds of knowledge and certain rote skills that are hard to do and require a lot of skillfulness to execute on, but have not been trained in the deep basis that would allow them to self-teach anything. Now, of course, we're entering into the phase where those kinds of abilities, your skills, and in particular, your knowledge, aren't particularly interesting anymore. You, know, you can imagine that being able to add large, add and multiply large numbers. Remember the idea of a calculator literally used to be a person, an actual human being who was trained in doing calculation quickly and with precision. And then we invented a tool that could do that more quickly and with more precision. And so to be a calculator no longer was a, a valuable way of contributing to the culture. Well, this is happening everywhere and it's going to be happening at an accelerating pace. And so if what you think you're going to do to respond to that is you're going to leap from one sinking island to another sinking island. Oh, well, I'll stop being a truck driver and now I'm going to be a software programmer. You may have bought yourself a little bit of time, but well, guess what? Software programming is going to go underwater too. So is doctor and so is fill in the blank. Um, and I picked software programmer on purpose because it's obviously going to be one of the taller islands. But unless you happen to be really, really good at it, the portion that you're doing is going to be automated by the people who are above you on that stack because that's where a lot of the automation is happening. So interestingly, if I can just kind of interject here, um, we've been playing a lot of music lately and I've downloaded a few new applications. I've been outside of the music uh, production scene for a long time and suddenly I'm back into it and I see all these new software applications that allow for automatic arpeggiation of scales and chords and very complicated, very advanced chord structures that can be arranged for you automatically. So even these very high-level artistic creative structures are now just being, you know, like you can have an improvised lead that is automatically beautiful and in some sort of very complex jazz structure, and you can have that generated for you with the push of a button. I mean, that's one of those things I would have thought would be kind of last to go is the artistic expression, but it's actually easier to make that go than I would imagine, like you say, software programming. Right. Well, so that's it. So what ends up happening is, is that things that are the deepest are the things that are going to last. And so if you're trying to figure out where to go, go there. So I can invert it. The things that are the deepest are also the things that are the highest. So if the flood is coming and you're seeking high ground, this is the highest ground. And so what I can say also is that it is not just the highest ground that we've found. It actually is the highest ground. There is nothing. There is no way to go any higher to be more safe. It is the actual basis upon which everything else derives. So that's one piece. Now, another piece, which is very interesting, is because it is so foundational, it also is related to more kinds of things. So I've, we've just been talking about it in the context of, call it, useful skills or ways of providing value. So moving from being a truck driver to being a software programmer or a chef. But these things are at the bottom of everything. So how to be able to be in relationship with yourself, how to be able to be a good friend, how to be able to be a good parent, how to make choices about what to eat. All possible choice making in all possible contexts are founded on these kinds of capacities. And so not only are these kinds of capacities primordially useful in the context of how to do stuff in call it the, maybe the economic domain, they are actually primordially useful in all domains. And so they are the most useful things to have at the basis of your fundamental portfolio of things that you're good at. Let me just add last, the, the last, just to make sure we have the right kind of context. A deep insight that is not very well shared is that pace of change matters. That if things are changing slowly, it's actually okay to just have the surface level adaptive 
skills or capacities associated with the place that you're at. If you know, being able to, let me think of a simple example, if being able to grow um, yams is adequate to feed you and your family, and the place that you're at is going to have the same essential characteristics for yam growing for a million years, then it's actually kind of okay to just sort of have the rituals of yam growing passed down from hand from person to person without having to build a deeper basis that would allow you to also be able to grow wheat or to be able to fish. But if things are changing, you have to go deeper. And the faster they're changing, the deeper you have to go. And so because we're in a space where accelerating change is a primary characteristic, we're also in a space where depth is a primary characteristic. Right. And like you said, this relates to all domains. For example, both of us have done a lot of meditation and it's the same kind of process. At a certain point, you can't really be taught. You just have to figure out how to deconstruct your own mind and to keep deconstructing it until there's nothing left to deconstruct. And so, you know, the whole process that you're talking about relates to to everything, including things that are very experiential and kind of very subjective. Yes. And now that you just brought into my mind, I'm not sure how, maybe the next major move, which is we've now been talking about all of this from the point of view of a single person. But everything that we've been talking about is perfectly exactly relevant in the context of groups of people. And in fact, going down also, uh, your cells and organs relate to each other in this way to make you. So there's a continuity going from quantum phenomena all the way up to the universe. But in the particular case, you as an individual have relations of coherence with regard to certain capacities to render them into embodiment. But say, for example, the two of you as a group, as a couple, as a, a partnership, also have this this loop, but it's at the level of the relationship. The relationship itself has a certain kind of agency, has a certain kind of discernment that neither of you holds completely. There's a wholeness to it that is equivalent to the wholeness of, for example, the relationships of your muscles that enable you to juggle. There's something about the way the relationship builds its own capacities to do things as a relationship. And a jazz band is the classic example. That there's something about the jazz band that is that is synergistic. It is emergent. It is more than just the actual players. There's something about the coming togetherness in a form of coherence that allows the jazz band as a band to do something that is not available in any of the distinct individuals. And you have to play together. Right? You have to actually build discernment as a whole. You have to build attunement as a whole. You have to build coherence as a whole. And then, of course, you have built embodiment as a whole, which allows you to go out and do something, like play jazz well. That's another deep, important thing, because these plug together. In order for me to most fully enter into relationship with you, to the degree to which I've built mastery of discernment in myself, I can then use that mastery of discernment in myself in the process of building skillfulness in discernment as us. This relates to what you were talking about um, when we spoke the first time, I think, where you talked about how sovereignty is fractal in a way, that you can have sovereignty as an individual, and then there's also a level of sovereignty in a small group, and then in a larger group, and then in a society, and a nation, civilization. Yep, that's right. So what we're describing can be described as the the characteristics of sovereignty. So would you describe sovereignty as a mastery of all these different levels of discernment, uh, attunement, etc.? Or is this kind of a separate aspect of it? It's actually a little bit oblique. So what I would say is that in order to achieve sovereignty, one must use these particular capacities in the domain that you're considering. Sovereignty is a measure of the relationship between one's capacity and the conditions that one is in. So for example, when I have learned how to juggle, you might say that I have sovereignty within a particular context of juggling. But let's say, for example, I'm trying to juggle while riding a unicycle. I may not yet have sovereignty in that domain. 
sovereignty has to do with a kind of a longitudinal ability of your current state to respond to a set of challenges such that your continuing ability to respond to those challenges is on some level of steady state or upgradient, which is to say that I, I can keep doing it without losing my ability to keep doing it. So the, these two pieces fit together. They're not reducible to each other. So would you say that sovereignty and mastery are kind of the same thing or not really? I feel like they're, so now we're in a subtle state of discernment. So I'll, I'll actually apply it. I feel like there's a distinction, but I feel like the distinction is subtle. So they are close, which is to say that for most purposes, you can probably use them interchangeably, but there is a distinction. And so it's important not to think that they are in fact actually interchangeable. You think if I can give a little bit of a better hint as to where that distinction lies. Well, I said that, that these, two, these two stories are oblique, meaning that they're related to a different set of things. Mastery relates to an arc of skillfulness. So I'm going to give that in more detail. When you enter into a particular practice, a particular relationship to, to reality, juggling, in the beginning, you have no skillfulness. Right? So you're really just at the basis of, of raw, uncertain discernment. As your discernment increases and your attunement increases, you begin to enter into coherence, what happens is your skillfulness increases. Uh, Your ability to move energy through your instrument to get signal is higher. As your skillfulness increases, I'm going to describe a particular transformation. I'm going to call it artfulness. The movement from skillfulness to artfulness has to do with that transition into embodiment, meaning that you've reached an adequate level of discernment, attunement, and coherence, and clarity that it's actually becoming, your ability to access this level of insight has moved into a space of kind of being easy and being enduring under larger and larger challenges. So what I can say now is that your sovereignty at artfulness, your sovereignty in this particular domain has actually expanded. Your ability to do has expanded. And then mastery is when you're actually now able to use this capacity to build further capacity under duress, under higher, harder domains. So the arc from skillfulness to artfulness to mastery really very much lives on this learning loop. Sovereignty comes at it obliquely. It comes at it from the point of view of in a given circumstance, in a given moment, what is the relationship between your capacity and the environment that you're in? So if you have achieved mastery, then also you will be sovereign at the level of your mastery. So let's go back to juggling. If I've achieved mastery of juggling and what I'm doing is juggling, then I have sovereignty in the domain of juggling. If I've achieved mastery of juggling, but what I'm doing now is trying to use to juggle while riding a unicycle, my sovereignty in this moment is actually quite low. But so I have not achieved mastery of the new domain. I've only achieved mastery of the subdomain of juggling, maybe juggling and riding a unicycle. So there's a relationship between the two. The sovereignty has to do with the ability to maintain my ability to respond to my environment in the context that I'm in on an ongoing basis. And it will use my mastery, my skillfulness, of which there's many dimensions, in that process. Right. So to simplify it, it seems like mastery is more about skillfulness and understanding of a certain domain, whereas sovereignty is more about your ability to make choices in response to whatever is happening. Yes, that's very nice. Thank you, Jordan. So we will continue this conversation in the next episode. To summarize for our listeners, we talked about what the Deep Code framework is, We talked about the cycle of learning, which can be applied to anything in life, and how it can be used to gain more sovereignty in today's world. For all the show notes, mentions, and resources, go to futurethinkers.org slash 62. The second part of this interview can be found at the same link once it goes live. And to check out our sponsor, Neurohacker, go to futurethinkers.org slash brainhack. If you're new to the show and you'd like a list of our top episodes and resources, go to futurethinkers.org slash start. If you want to sponsor our show, go to futurethinkers.org slash sponsor. If you like our podcast, leave us a rating and a review on iTunes and elsewhere. It helps others find the show, and we really appreciate it. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you in the next episode. Bye! Bye.